Thank you, and welcome to Experiments to Create Audience Connections. Oh, wow. We're being, <laughs> got it. Um, my name is Sherry Scalco. I'm the executive director of Injustice Watch, which is a nonprofit um, investigative news organization based here in Chicago, focusing on um, issue, systemic issues of inequality where the intersection of social um, justice and the law. And I am joined here by Carrie Porter, Harry Backlund, and Sarah Schlombach. Schmalbeck. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, if you guys could introduce yourselves and I'll leave Rebecca back. Uh, so, hi everybody. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. So, I am a journalist and I work as a consultant for Shorenstein Center at the Center for Media and Politics. Third time. <laughs> and uh, third time's a try. And uh, we focus on many things, but one of which that I've been working on is business models for news. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> nice. Uh, my name is Harry Backland. I'm the director of operations and one of four co-founders at City Bureau. We're a civic journalism lab based here in Chicago. Uh, so we're uh, kind of partway between a media outlet and an uh, education group or kind of think tank. We're working to make practices for producing local journalism that are responsive to communities that have a stake in the stories that are being reported. My name is Sarah. Oh. I think it takes a second. Great. Okay. Uh, my name is Sarah Schmalbach. I work for the Lenfest Institute. Uh, it's a journalism nonprofit based in Philadelphia. Um, I just moved back to Philly. That's where I'm from. Um, and we are spinning up kind of a, a local news lab there uh, for a period of one year. So part of being here too is if anyone's interested in talking to me afterwards, collaborating. We want to run um, experiments for the next year uh, on how to better kind of pair technology. Um, with local news, uh, with kind of a focus on how we um, just find ways to for local news to be more valuable to folks. How can we pair up stories with what you're really interested in, um, find ways to have news arrive when it's most valuable, interesting, and relevant to you. Um, but before I came to Philly, I co-led the Guardian Mobile Innovation Lab um, up in their New York office for a couple of years um, and ran a lot of cool kind of mobile storytelling experiments there. Um, and then before then, I was at USA Today as a mobile product manager. And before that, um, I was in Philly, uh, where I kind of started this whole journey, um, helping them launch their first mobile apps, which feels like it was like 80 years ago, but it was like eight years ago. Um, so that's kind of my background. I did go to journalism school as well, but have kind of found my way onto the product and technology side. We'll file this one under, we love it when a plan comes together, mm -hmm. is I, we understand, like the last session talked about um, business models and about how um, publishers essentially have to look for new um, ways to keep their business going, essentially. And audience and the connection with their audience is going to be key. And so we're just going to be discussing how to cultivate genuine relationships with your audience um, and experimenting to do so. Um, before we begin, though, we'd like to get a sense of the composition of the audience. So how many folks here are from legacy news organizations where your digital product is attached to broadcast or print? Okay, and then how many are digital only? Okay, so almost like halves. Did you, is, are there any other folks you want to understand? How many of you come from business or how many of you come from editorial or something in between? So, which one? <laughs> which one? <laughs> All him. So, mostly product then? Web dev? Okay. How about, are there folks who would identify as coming from community media in any sense? Couple. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. <laughs> so we are also um, highly interactive here, um, very much organic. Um, I'm going to be roving with this microphone, and if you have any questions, please jump in, but we'll also be turning to you guys to, to get your feedback to help guide this conversation um, in a way that's going to be more beneficial for you. So I'm going to start with the first question for you guys is there are loads of best practices out there. Why experiment? Hmm. I think I just have a quick thought. It yeah. might not be the most insightful one. But um, 
having worked in a couple of legacy news organizations um, and worked with a lot of engineers and a lot of editors, um, I'm always struck by uh, like the cost of change uh, and kind of what you might think a small tweak on kind of the front end of a product. Um, you know, it might be kind of making a small change, but when you think about kind of all the pipes and the plumbing and the things that it takes to kind of um, uh, change infrastructure to support new product development, it becomes really complex. So one of the reasons that I uh, think that experimentation is essential in, in most places, and in particular digital news, um, is that you need to be testing things before you want to scale systems that support it, right? So if you want to do things like personalization or customization or one-on-one um, -on -one conversations with your readers, uh, it's good to know a little bit more about what works um, before you start building kind of scalable systems to support it in the long term, um, which is why kind of doing, doing quicker tests and measuring them really effectively, which we can talk a little bit about later, kind of knowing up front what success looks like um, is kind of another great part of experimentation. Mm -hmm. It's unlocked a lot of um, you know, good work for me and the teams that I've been on um, is, is kind of one of the reasons that I think it's so, so essential. Yeah, I would just add to that that I think best practices are good um, inherently, but what will make one's editorial product really sing is its value prop, which requires it to be unique. So while there are probably a handful of gold standard rules, it's also really valuable when you can identify the ways in which you zag when everyone else zigs. And you get there through experimenting. Harry, did you have Sure. Yeah, I might zoom out on the question and then think a little bit about what City Bureau could bring to that conversation. So if the question is why do we need to experiment or why should we experiment, uh, I think innovation is a hot word. It's probably been a hot word for a long time, probably before our time. Um, it can mean many different things, and I think it's important to think about what we're talking about in the context of news. Uh, I think lately, when in journalism, when we talk about innovation, we're talking about a response to a crisis in the industry that like, we have to respond to, to survive. Um, and then within that, too, if, if innovation is happening in response to a crisis, some people are talking about the response in terms of saving money, whether it's their own companies because they're uh, running a media company or whether it's our own jobs because we love doing this and like getting paid to do work that we love. Uh, and then some people also are talking about responding to that crisis in order to save a critical public good that's necessary for de a democracy and maybe even before that for any kind of collective life. Uh, and then the kicker is that most of us are in both of those camps at the same time, understanding that this is really important work. and. Uh, also trying to find a business model that will work for it. Um, I think where City Bureau is coming from, I was really interested that the last discussion uh, kind of focused around the end of the advertising economy or the decline of the advertising economy and the rise of these other revenue models, uh, whether it's subscriptions or metered paywalls. Um, I think all of those innovations are kind of centering around a relationship with readers that wasn't there when it was driven by advertising because revenue was always triangulated. So you built a relationship with your audience in order to market that to people who were interested in purchasing their attention. Um, as that drops away, I think a lot of what is driving the innovation that we're doing at City Bureau and that a lot of folks in this room are doing is thinking about ways to build deeper and more honest and authentic relationships with the audience and then uh, find ways to use that as the foundation for uh, a sustainable model. So being able to activate those relationships to make the work uh, possible and make it better. So with a good half of our audience being involved in legacy organizations, the relationship with their audience has been through or because of advertising. So where is a good place to start experimenting, making it a one-on-one -on -one mutually beneficial relationship, a genuine relationship? And when we say relationship, we're talking the reader and the news outlet, right? Is that what we're talking about? I'm putting it back out to you. When we talk about relationship, we're talking about the reader and the news outlet? Yes? Yeah. Okay, so to take a step back, where to start, especially if you're coming from a legacy media organization. Um, I think your newsletter work is. 
Either that or you can say you didn't like that question. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I it. like That's, it. You can edit I like it. That's fine. Um, well, I mean, so I think this might be a good time, Terry mentioned, to talk about. So one thing we've been doing at Shorenstein that's been really fun is doing a deep dive on newsletters. So I've been spending a lot of time reading a lot of different newsletters. Any of you want ideas or suggestions, talk to me after. Um, and, and what we've come to find is that there's like three different ways that newsletters function in email. Um, but I more broadly like to think of them as like a living room and you as a reader get to um, invite uh, the news organization into the living room of your inbox and it's kind of a private place. It's different from when you go to a web browser or uh, even like a social media page. It's something that's just yours alone. And so the way that that kind of plays out in an experimentation is that you get to ask yourself what kind of what kind of company or what kind of guest do you want to be and what kind of story do you want to tell and i think that becomes really fun when you uh, think about your value proposition and where you see your ultimate um, roi for the reader um, if that makes sense I guess one comment, tangential comment I might add. Um, I was just responding to, we didn't have a chance to talk about it right before, but this idea, like the decline of the advertising industry or the advertising revenue. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess the, the different take I have on it is that like advertising, particularly online, is, is alive and thriving and is a huge business, just not for us anymore, right? Like uh, just given the current state of the industry. And, and I think that kind of the current ad model with its, you know, what makes it so successful is its targeting. Um, and you could almost just kind of argue that metaphorically that advertisers kind of know their audience enough to kind of give them the types of ads that might resonate with them a lot. I know that one of my colleagues, um, uh, if you don't know Yossi Lichterman um, or subscribe to his weekly newsletter called The Solution Set, you should, he's really brilliant. But um, he tweeted the other day something about how like an Instagram ad finally got him, right? And he was like shaking his fist, but it was also this really great um, like sweatshirt. Uh, that, that he was really into. So anyway, um, and he thinks a lot about uh, kind of connection with audiences. And I think that one of, one of the things that I think that we could do more of is um, in a more ethical way, collect information about our audience that gives us a sense of what they want to read, what they want to see, when they want to receive it, um, and kind of just create a, a better model for relationships through content and community engagement. Um, that, that it has similar principles, shares similar principles with the kind of the successful ads that you see today, um, but kind of adheres to all of the, the changes and impact that we'd like to have uh, in communities through, through news and engagement. So I don't know, would you guys like kind of challenge that notion at all, um, that we're trying to inherit some of those principles or kind of adopt them, but through content? I like that. I feel like it, the complement to that also is, um, Engagement, also a very hot word right now, but I think what that often means is uh, direct correspondence and relationships with readers. So being open to feedback from readers and making the experience of that feedback part of um, what an outlet is providing when it's providing news. So I think that uh, that might be the sort of limit to collecting really rich data about what people want is if we already come with all of the categories established, there might be things that we're missing, mm -hmm. or we're also not making, not letting readers or participants in media uh, set the terms for how they want to engage. And, and I think that sense of participation is driving a lot of the new rev revenue models, or at least is an important ingredient in something like subscription or membership. Um, yeah. So, Harry, you bring up something interesting because we talked about um, newsletters and data which are digitally based, but City Bureau is face-to-face. -face. Yeah. What, how, did, how did it come about and what is the, like, where did you start, especially when it came to creating these relationships with established media organizations? Sure. Um, I'll try to keep this quick because it's, it's, a, it's a good story, but it can be a long story. Yeah. Hold on a second. How many people are familiar with City Bureau? Okay, not that's enough. Amazing. Go ahead. Nice. Yeah, yes. that's great. Um, thank you. That's all right. But the... Thank you for being here. And we, love, we love sharing our yes, work, especially no, with amazing. people who are experts and asking a lot of the same questions. Um, City Bureau started in 2015. 
Uh, it was started by four, four of us. We were all working in different areas of media, come out of uh, local publishing and operations and community media. Uh, my colleague Bettina Chang was an editor, most recently at Chicago Magazine. Daryl Holliday was a local reporter, Crime Beat, Neighborhood News, and uh, Andrea Hart was doing uh, youth media work, working with local nonprofits in the city. Uh, all of us were frustrated with some of the conditions of the Chicago media ecosystem. Um, really inaccurate misrepresentative coverage of whole neighborhoods, uh, especially around issues of race, um, a real lack of pretty every kind of diversity at every level of Chicago media and a deep distrust between uh, many newsrooms and a lot of neighborhoods in Chicago. Uh, and we were, I think we were feeling very limited in our own work. Um, so it's, we bootstrapped it in the beginning, the zero dollar budget. Um, we got a group of reporters together and started a fellowship, which was really people just getting together to report on stories that they felt like should be covered uh, and kind of build some mutual support around that work. So we'd get together on Wednesdays and eat pizza and file FOIA requests and start to partner with outlets to publish that work. Um, from there, we, uh, the fellowship grew into a paid opportunity. So we run three cycles a year, 10 reporters. Uh, come together, work in teams around issues, and we partner with outlets around the city to publish that work. Uh, there's all kinds of reporters in our cycles, but we're really active about uh, recruiting emerging reporters of color and other people who are underrepresented in Chicago's media. Uh, we also run an open workshop series called The Public Newsroom. So every Thursday evening, we have some kind of free uh, hands-on skills-based workshop where a journalist or somebody working around a local issue comes in and presents. Uh, and it's supposed to be something beneficial to the people who show up for this, so they get some kind of new skill or information. And it's also supposed to change the work that is being presented. So if a journalist comes in, we hope that they are open to the feedback that they get in that space. Um, and the last program, which I think is maybe most relevant to the conversation about innovation, is uh, documentaries. Uh, we're, the short version is we're training and paying people to cover public meetings in Chicago. So there's a form on our website. Anybody can fill it out. If you fill it out, you're invited to come to a training. If you come to one training, you're eligible to take paid assignments to go to government meetings in Chicago and either make a recording or take very structured notes or live tweet it. Uh, and then we collect all that information and make it available to the public, to other journalists, uh, to try to create sort of a groundswell of coverage around local journalism and also just engage a lot of folks and make it a lot easier to participate in the process. Uh, and the last piece, we're, we're building some basically a user management system and a set of scrapers that pull all the information about the meetings in the city and then make it really easy to assign those out to documenters who are interested. So we're working on that and are hoping to have that com complete in the next couple of months. Um, all that said, sometimes our work is talked about as being sort of way on one end of the spectrum in terms of engagement and uh, you know what it means to be engaging with readers and an audience. Um, and I think that's true in some ways. We're proud of that in some ways. But uh, I think there's a lot that we've learned that we want to make useful for news organizations that are working across the spectrum. Um, and I think no matter what kind of outlet you're at, this question of which direction you're facing, whether you're thinking more about building relationships with readers and talking to, to speaking to the kind of full person that, you're, you're, that will be buying your product, or uh, whether you're facing in the direction of what the ad economy had asked for from us, which was really heavy metrics and kind of um, a very rationalized picture of what uh, decisions like that were going to, how they were going to happen. Um, so I do feel like a lot of what we learn is, can be applied anywhere. And like, I think the newsletter is a great example because that's an example of legacy media organizations taking work that they already do and finding a way to present it to people in a way that's much more intimate and allows for more feedback. And um, I think these things are possible across the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So does anybody have, first of all, does anybody have any questions? This is not the end of the presentation. I'm just <laughs> checking in with all of you. Good so far. OK, so what about um, how to, to, to experiment? Let's get into the really the nitty gritty, because and. You guys are going to have to correct me if I'm wrong here, but from a product standpoint you, or from a, a, a tech standpoint, you've got either insight into data or some sort of usage statistics 
you're, uh, you consume a lot of media, you see how other folks are doing it successfully, and yet you've got all of these ideas and no audience, no, when I say no audience, no partners in other parts of your business to get this experiment, these experiments going. Um, what are your suggestions? What have you seen in your experiences from an operational standpoint? Yeah. So one of my favorite things to talk about is organizational design. <laughs> uh, I just think that one thing I've learned is that it's wonderful to have ideas, but then it's also the execution. And then you can't really do the execution without collaboration and clarity uh, of roles. And so it's been really, really in, um, rewarding to work with different media organizations through the work at Shorenstein, looking at their newsletters and specifically seeing what happens when newsletters are run by just one person and what happens when they're run across different teams, when um, they're shared across departments. And um, what's neat about it is that I think you need to have buy-in across departments. I wonder how many of you have kind of come across that where you have a new idea and you get only so far and then you realize you don't have buy-in within the, within the institution to keep going. But I think um, getting everybody on the same page is really helpful. So thinking of the newsletter as not just an editorial product, but something that uh, is also a business product uh, can be really helpful. And that's why I have this thing I really, like I, I agree about the term engagement because it's thrown around all the time, but I like this idea of engagement as the middle path. You know, there's like editorial and there's business and it's been church and state. Um, and I feel like the engagement folks often can kind of form this bridge um, for having conversations that are useful so that we really can actually make sure that we're reaching people with the things that they want versus what we think that they want. Um, so I think that starting with that is like who should be in the room right now to have this conversation is a good place to start. You have Sarah? Um, well, one of the things that worked really well for us uh, in the Guardian Mobile Innovation Lab is, um, well, one, we were completely multidisciplinary, right? So I think that there's kind of this slow awakening to the fact that um, people with lots of different expertise need to come to the table, like you said, um, to kind of execute, analyze, uh, market, fill something with content, um, give it kind of a spirit. So um, in the lab, uh, you know, I was the product manager and there was an editorial co-lead. Um, and that was kind of transformational as well. So kind of to, to share decision making from a product perspective and an editorial perspective. And um, Sasha and I both had experience on the other side, right? So I had my master's in journalism, but became a product manager. Um, she was the editor of the lab, but had had, had various product roles at the New York Times. Um, so, so that was a pretty important piece to us being able to effectively run a lab um, and, and run experiments that um, were useful for users, but also like very editorially sound. Um, and then the rest of the team looked like, you know, we had two engineers, um, an associate editor, uh, and a product designer, right? So that's kind of what I tend to think of as kind of table stakes for if you're going to do something innovative and digital, um, but also uh, be a great, a great piece of content. So what we did was um, we sat down, we were there for about six weeks together, and we would meet in the kitchen every day around lunch and just talk about all of the things that um, kind of came to mind as better ways to use technology as it relates to journalism. Um, and me being like a constant note taker, product person, ended up with like 15 pages of notes of like all the things we wanted to see in the world. Um, and a couple of them were things like, uh, you know, a better use of notifications instead of kind of the very irritating, intrusive version of, of breaking news alerts that you see today. And this was like three years ago now. Um, and, and we had this really long list, and then what I did was I, I just started putting them into categories, right? Like some of these things look similar, and, and this falls under this umbrella. Um, and we came out of that process with like five um, areas of focus for the lab, just to give ourselves a little bit of structure. Um, and included things like notifications, like how can we build better notification formats for news. Um, live coverage, you know, we hypothesized it was a bit miserable right now. It's very text driven. You can't get caught up very easily when you go into a live blog. Um, it's hard to scan, stuff like that. And so we had these five areas of focus. And then we did that thing that like, if all else fails in a newsroom, just offer people snacks. And we would have weekly office hours and just say like, hey, we're thinking a lot about technology and innovation and journalism and we love The Guardian and I know we're new here, but um, please come eat like ice cream cake and popcorn with us. 
um, and and let's see what we can come up with. And uh, yeah, a really wonderful business reporter named Yana um, came and said, hey, you know, um, I cover the jobs report the first Friday of every month or the last Friday. Sorry, Yana. Um, and we send this push notification out and it's totally indistinguishable from everybody else's push notification about the jobs report, which if you've ever gotten that alert, says like this is the percentage uh, of unemployment rate and this is how many jobs are added. Uh, so we just came up with this kind of cool idea where um, there's so much interesting stuff that's embedded in a jobs report in terms of like socioeconomically, which you know sector of the population is being impacted, like who does and does not have jobs. Um, and we built a little notification that had um, little buttons on the bottom and it said, here's the jobs report, high level numbers. Uh, now, do you want the good news or the bad news first? Um, and you could kind of pull yourself through like a little explainer of the implications of the jobs report without leaving your lock screen which we thought was pretty cool. Um, and like a fun thing that we learned through experimentation, I mean like 14 people signed up for our first experiment. Um, and we said, do you want the good news or the bad news first with like thumbs up, thumbs down emoji? And we realized just for talking, we talked to like four people and they were like, oh, I thought you wanted us, you were rating the jobs report as in like good jobs report or like bad jobs report. <laughs> um, and that wasn't what we were trying to achieve. So we changed it to like a you know, smiley face and a frowny face. And like those are kind of, um, there is this tension between like granular insights and then kind of like global strategy, right? And how you approach things. And um, I think that one of the things I struggle with when I'm talking to stakeholders about innovation work is that um, a single idea for an experiment can, can sound so small, yep. um, but you're trying to get at a much bigger insight through kind of launching something small, and you are trying to get quantitative and qualitative feedback and get a full picture of how people are experiencing things. And um, I mean, unless I'm wrong, like I think that's a very new discipline to be bringing to news in general, mm -hmm. um, and then layering on kind of that product approach that can be very uh, kind of granular and interesting, but, um, and it builds and, and there's momentum, but um, it takes a while for people to see that. So um, that's just one example. Yeah. Assessing success. So we talked about you early on, you mentioned what does success look like? How do you how measure it? How do you look at it? Because Harry City Bureau isn't natively connected with metrics, like especially like that we're used to. So go down the line and talk to me about how <laughs> how we how, how you we define measure. our success. How do you find your success? How do you measure? Um, so the first thing is, this brings up a, another question, which I have, if I may, yes, you can. <laughs> um, which is, you know, as we do move away from advertising, um, those metrics around just like abundant content, um, how are those going to shift and what are those new metrics? Um, I think there's a lot of work happening around moving away from like the so-called vanity metrics mm -hmm. to these new ways of um, pointing success. Um, one really clear way is subscribers, just to go back to newsletters, is like, what's the rate of people who are subscribing and how often are they opening? Yep. And then also do, by the way, they want to donate or become members. <laughs> Those are our favorites. Um, not that we have favorites ever, obviously. <laughs> uh, but I think, you know, those are some key ways that we can tell, I think, um, it's also just kind of a success when you create something, an editorial product that didn't exist before, while still you know, using the resources you have and ideally valuing your staff in a way where they're not being over leveraged. Um, that's like a really big success, um, from, especially if you go back to that work design thing. Yes. So those are some of the things I would be thinking about. I th How do you guys measure? So I was going to say, we do, um, I think we're not at all opposed to metrics, and we do keep a lot of metrics. Yeah. So what, what are you measuring, though? It's not. I think we measure a lot of, probably a lot of the same stuff that folks in this room are measuring. So we track our newsletter signups. Yeah. We keep careful track of social engagement. Uh, we publish our stories with other outlets, but as much as possible, we try to get uh, metrics on who's reading and okay. uh, as much as we're able to work into our agreements. Um, I think our, and we also do a ton of evaluation, um, but I think our orientation is, like, it, and to your question, Kara, I think it's, from what we've seen, it will be a shift 
towards qualitative from yeah. purely quantitative, or towards maybe even towards a better relationship between qualitative information about reader decisions and quantitative. Um, because like, we'll do a survey after almost any event. We'll send something out. And we may not run a ton of deep analytics on the responses, because we may do a public newsroom that 15 people come to. And some of our best ones are also very small, because the people, their niche and the people who show up really care about them. Um, and like the percentage of people who answer a certain way to a response, I mean, the sample size may just not be big enough. Like it, the, the, the metrics in that sense aren't meaningful. But what they write and the relationship between what they write and why they check a particular number starts to inform our decision making and also starts to inform how we read those bigger picture metrics. Um, so I, I think that's also like, what are we going to do with all this data? Like, we're going to continue to use it, I hope. Um, but I, I think we'll read it in a much different way and, and have different goals in what we want to see it delivering for us and for readers. Uh, because the metrics that we get also like, are not self-evident. Like, we, don't, we don't actually know why things are happening, you know? <laughs> uh, even if we can like, really thoroughly segment uh, and track people through, a, say, a subscription funnel, why somebody's actually motivated to take a particular step, like they may not even know. Uh, and so the more that we can have that conversation and better understand how our stakeholders feel about us and kind of fulfill their expectations, I think that will be important for success in this new economy. Sarah, you were nodding a lot. Yeah, um, I think measurement was one of my favorite things about the Guardian Mobile Innovation Lab because when we first started out, um, we didn't know how we were going to measure. Um, and we kind of stumbled upon our strategy uh, kind of serendipitously, but I'm so grateful for it. And, and that is really that um, some of the reasons that we're so stuck, I think, on vanity metrics is that they're so easy, right? It's like, well, we published a story that had 10,000 page views, and then we published another story that had 20,000 page views, so this second story is twice as good, right? Like, that was a success. Um, and that relies on having a benchmark for success, right? Which if we're now like eight, 10, 15 years into kind of like digital journalism, um, you've got a lot of legacy vanity metrics that people kind of keep using. Um, but for us, when we were, we were building completely new formats, like, um, like a jobs report notification explainer, which has no benchmark for it, right? Um, so we talked to some really smart user experience researcher folks at the Guardian office in London and said, you know, how would you measure this? And they said, well, you know, we set the bar really low and said, listen, we're doing something brand new. Um, these formats have never existed. We just want to know, we apply technology to this content. Was this useful for the reader and was it interesting? Like, that was it. And if it was useful and if it was interesting, then we would consider it like a success uh, in the lab because it's all additive to kind of all of the engagement and content that The Guardian was already kind of creating through, through other means. Um, and, and it certainly evolved from there. And we, of course, looked at things like how many people opted into these job notifications. And um, we did really granular metric setting, right? So we would um, have a whole custom GA uh, kind of implementation ready to go where we could see, you know, if people were tapping on these little buttons that said it was a good job support, it was a bad job support, when did they fall off and why and what time of day and in what country, right? Um, and we actually hired people to do this for us, right? So we initially thought that we could have one analyst on our tiny little team. Um, and we were hiring for a lot of roles that we didn't have experience in, right? I'm a product manager. Sasha was an editor. Um, and we quickly realized after bringing in these <laughs> poor folks that we were interviewing is that we really needed like three people, right? Because analytics and measurement to me breaks down into kind of these three categories, which is somebody who can kind of um, uh, talk to you about what you need to measure and track, right? Like set up kind of all of these custom um, tracking implementation uh, frameworks, like, like making sure that you have their geolocation and making sure that you have the action buttons on your notification tracked. So there's kind of that, that tracking framework. And then you need people to be able to implement the tracking, right? Which is like a really huge task in and of itself. Um, and a lot of people like to drag and drop uh, Google Analytics tracking, but if you're doing something experimental, you might need to get a little bit more granular. So we needed that type of person. Uh, and then we needed somebody at the end of the experiment to look at all the quantitative and all the qualitative data and analyze it for us, right? Like look for trends. That takes a lot of time. 
Um, so we worked with a company, uh, they've since been acquired, uh, it's called Hero Digital. They're based in Philly. Um, and they did all of that for us, right? And they were kind of these spiritual gurus. Like we would get really excited about the product and how we were gonna build it. We would talk to them for an hour. And they would deliver this like four page Bible back to us and said, okay, here's all the questions that you wanna answer by the end of this experiment. And here's how you qualitatively and quantitatively measure against each of these questions before anything ever launched which was totally kind of transformative for us, right? So we knew going into every experiment that we were going to be able to answer at least the questions that we could imagine in, in advance. Um, and, and that was a really wonderful experience. And we've written up, you know, I don't want to kind of go on too long about it here, but that would go into every uh, write-up. After we did an experiment, we would publish all of our findings on Medium, um, which was another kind of very, like, you know, open thing yeah. for us to do. And all of our code is kind of on GitHub from that lab. And we aspire to do the same thing um, kind of in the, in the LenFest lab going forward as well. But I, I love measurement. And I could tell you about one metric, if it's interesting, called the net interaction rate. Does anyone want to hear about the net interaction rate? Just raise your I hand. Do. OK, cool. There you go. Okay. Awesome. Um, <laughs> so alive. yes. Um, it's so, it's such a great metric. Um, and it, people tell me that it's like a net promoter score, but I, I had never heard of that before. But anyway, um, since we were building these new features and people were like engaging with it a lot, they had to like touch all these action buttons or tap on a lot of things in a new live blog format. Um, we were trying to acknowledge the fact that like some people are going to have a negative experience, right? Like sometimes they're going to tap a button on a notification, it's going to go away. And they're going to be like, I didn't want that to go away, right? Um, and the nice thing about running notification experiments is that you can send them another notification with a link to a survey to tell us how it went. So that was like a really great loop, um, feedback loop. Uh, so, so one of the parts of this process was that we would talk about all the ways that someone could like touch the experiment, like all of the ways they could interact with it. And we would code the interactions of, as positive or negative, right? So if somebody hits the button that says like stop this thing, that was negative. Um, if somebody clicks through on an alert and it took you to an article that was positive, they wanted to engage with more of this content. Uh, so what you do is you just kind of take the positive interactions and you subtract the negative interactions divided by all of the interactions and you get either kind of like a positive or negative percentage point at the end, right? Um, and what that did was it took into account kind of those negative um, experiences. They were going to happen. But for us, our measure of success was like on the whole, overall, if you were to summarize the output, was this positive for folks. Um, and the even cooler thing about that is that we would like recode things as positive. I really advocated for neutral interactions, mm -hmm. right? And then that kind of like changed the game a little bit, but it was this really flexible and wonderful metric that was so quantitative, but so qualitative at the same time. Um, and uh, I, you know, I would highly, everyone probably has their own version of this in their organization, but if not, um, it's worth a conversation um, with kind of your analytics team, your product team, or whomever about kind of when people are using your stuff, what is positive and what is negative. Even if you don't implement the metric, like that conversation um, seems really essential to be having. There's one thing on the subject of success that I think can sometimes be lost, but is right there for us, which is also ease and simplicity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that Coming from an editorial background, I, I love getting my head around the story, but there's also just like what's right in front of us with the beauty and the simplicity of whatever product we're engaging with. And I think that's a whole nother part of measuring success of whatever we're producing. So when you say simplicity, are you talking about design? Or are you talking, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, design for sure. It's, it's really great when things are aesthetically pleasing. Mm -hmm. uh, but then in addition, I do mean, too, I think, like, in the last discussion, some of you may have heard one of the Q&A questions was, like, it would be terrific if there was a way to subscribe and unsubscribe from uh, news publications all in one place in the same way that I can subscribe and unsubscribe from podcasts. And, you know, I think that's an example of something where, from a, de you know, a design perspective, we would benefit um, thinking through some of those things. Just one little thing, um, an anecdote about a, a notification. We did do experiments other than notifications, by the way, but just easy to talk about. Um, it, for the presidential election, um, we worked with The Guardian to do like a live data notification. 
So you can sign up a couple of days before the election and get kind of the, the real-time results in an alert on your lock screen, and it would update itself, right? It kind of acted as like a little ticker, which is a new way to use alerts. Normally, people send an alert when the election like kicks off, right? And then when key states get announced, then they'll send an alert like Kentucky and Montana went for this person. Um, but this allowed it to sit on your lock screen and constantly update. Anyway, uh, there was a chef in Australia who kind of responded to our survey and said, like, this was amazing. Like, I was in the middle of a shift, and I was just super interested in the outcome, and I didn't have to kind of, like, open a live blog or do this yeah. or do that. Yeah. Um, and it was very easy and intuitive and, like, respectful of his time. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we were always really grateful to get that type of feedback. Why does a chef reading his phone in the middle of a shift not bring comfort to me. <laughs> <laughs> that also reminds me, I, I think I read something today about how The Economist, I actually haven't looked at it, but they just changed their mobile app um, with like this very specific intent of like not overwhelming you, um, which I think is another really cool thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I feel like we're kind of like funneling down to that, but so many of the questions around innovation and design and engagement, I feel like comes, and people were talking about it before, this idea of friction, like yeah. mm -hmm. who's, who's friction? Like when there's mm. friction, is it because you're making, uh, you're taking steps to accommodate what the user wants or needs, or is it because you're putting up obstacles to, so that your metrics look better? Uh, I just think so much of it comes down to res people want to be respected, and that sense of respect is a much better foundation for um, the news economy than the advertising model was. You're nodding, Sarah? Is there... Yeah, that's just an excellent point. Okay. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? I do. Please. So, this is all great. Like, with all the respect to the panel and everything like that, and I'm going to take a little Good start. Here do it. Second, but, um, growing up in the, Chicago, like, in the Chicago news market, you know, consuming news, you know, it is such a high tower thing in a lot of ways. Like, there's a lot of news media here is not, it's, and I'm hearing a lot of newsletters, a lot of push notifications. Mm -hmm. That's all one way communication to a user. And I find, and even today, as comments are becoming sort of pushed, being turned off on news websites, mm -hmm. at one point, do users get the ability to talk back to organizations? And or also, like, you know, we're not data, we're humans. We want to be able to to interact, and I think a lot of the reasons why I'm leaving traditional media, consuming traditional media, and going towards organic podcasts is because I have that two-way communication with the creator. You know, what? how are you creating engagements with users to combat that kind of stuff today? And it's so complicated, I understand. But. No, I, I love that question. Can you actually, though, answer quickly <laughs> what, what it is about podcasts that you think is different? So it's similar and different. I think the reason why I go to podcasts is because they are more niche and they're talking about topics that I care about versus, you know, uh, one other bone to pick, and I hate to say it, it's like I get breaking news alerts for stuff I really just don't care about and I can't turn them off. And it's like, I'm not a huge sports fan, but I get breaking news alerts from news organizations in Chicago. So stuff I don't care. And I can't really customize that very much. Mm. But when I go to podcasts, I can select what type of content I want and want to listen to. Right, so I think that kind of answers into yeah, that. Yeah, Do you want to speak to this? Sure. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, I feel like everything City Bureau is doing is in response to that problem. Um, and each of our programs, like the, the idea is that there there should be many many points of engagement that people can take to participate in the process of producing local media, not just like in, engaging with it in the sense of commenting on a story that's already been published but on having access to journalists while they're reporting a story, especially if that story affects their lives or is about the conditions of their lives. Um, so, I mean, in practice, the public newsroom, like we're all at the public newsroom almost every week and there are regulars at the public newsroom and we use that as a space that people come to to give feedback. We have editor's office hours also, which are publicized. So Bettina Chang, uh, there's a coffee shop across the hall from our office and uh, every Wednesday, every Tuesday afternoon from 3.30 to 5.30, she's there with a little sign plaque and really whoever wants to show up and talk about something. And there's often a lot of kind of uh, engagement around it too. People can tweet at her if they have questions. And 
Um, the fellowship, too, is designed to, like, there's a pretty low barrier. People need to have some experience producing media, but the expectation is not that you're a professional journalist. It's that you want to make a run at producing media that matters to you or, uh, or that you think matters to the city. Um, and documenters especially like that, we have about 350 people signed up for the program right now and roughly 200 that are eligible to take assignments. Uh, and we're hoping that the volume of meetings that they're taking and just the amount of engagement in that program scales a lot over the next couple of years, especially as we grow. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm totally with you. And I think the, the question that we still have to answer, I mean, we're very much a startup. We, we bootstrapped it, then we got some funding, and now we're building out some of the infrastructure that I think will sort of see how much we can operationalize this and make this kind of a model for how media could work. Um, yeah, and I, and I hope that what we do can also be useful to uh, legacy media outlets that are sort of in this position of having a more traditional one-way relationship. And, and so you have some relationships, too, with other organizations like Mississippi Today. You're about mm -hmm. to launch up in Detroit with, I'm going to screw it up, it's either DET or DTV. It is DET, WDET, -E awesome. yeah. yeah. Um, what has the, what, what have those um, converse, conversations been like? How that, that adoption, that receptiveness to what he was talking about of bringing in audiences into the process? Uh, it's, it's really early, so we're doing, we're piloting documenters in Detroit with WDET, the public radio station, and an organization called Citizen Detroit, um, to, especially around the elections that are coming up in Detroit and the school board meetings and all the charter school network meetings. So we're, we're seeing if documenters on a smaller scale could be an effective way to cover some of those meetings and make sure that DET's reporters have access to good information about, the, about education in Detroit going into that election. Uh, and then in Mississippi, there's, we've had a lot of conversations with folks in the Mississippi Delta. It's a much different landscape than Chicago in a lot of ways. There's also a lot of deep history and interesting connections. And, uh, but we're intrigued because reporting in rural areas comes with unique challenges. And it feels like having something like documentaries, like it's very difficult to drive around for one reporter to cover an area like that. But if you have a uh, say a retired person who lives up the street from where that meeting is happening who cares a lot and might be going to that meeting anyway uh, and asking a lot of good questions at that meeting if they could go and take some structure notes and share those. Um, it's really, really early and we're also asking a lot about the relationship between local. We think these things should exist and be adopted locally and so how, how we can support those without kind of coming in and replicating a lot of the problems is uh, on our minds too. Um, but we write about it all the time, so we'll, we'll let you know how it goes. Cool. Yes, they have a robust, a robust channel on Medium that is a treasure trove of information and great ideas. Was that helpful? Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Anybody else have questions?